Dr. Marissa uh, March, who's a cosmologist uh, who specializes in research on dark energy. She received her doctorate from Imperial College in London. Imperial College London was a research fellow at the University of Sussex and is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a member of the ground-based dark energy survey where she works on supernova cosmology and observes at CTIO's uh, Blanc uh, Blanco Telescope, I hope I have that correct. Dr. March has worked on galaxy lensing for the European Space Agency's future Euclid space mission. She also holds a bachelor's degree in Catholic theology from Haythrop College, London. So today she's going to talk to us about the Catholic scientist in the secular world, what is the meaning of our vocation, and how does it distinguish us? Thank you. So thanks very much for that great welcome. And I have to say that I submitted two abstracts to this conference. One was science, and one was this talk. And the board selected this talk, so, you know, here we are. <laughs> and I have to say, like, like Father Joachim, I'm also pretty nervous. I've written my talk out, and following his example, I'm also going to read it. It's going to be better for all of us. So as, as Catholic scientists, we stand in a privileged position. We stand at the meeting point of two worlds. We can stretch out our hands and touch both the material and the divine, and we're standing on the bridge between these two things. We experience the physical world through our senses, you know, we touch, see, uh, smell and taste, and through our research and our daily work. But at the same time, our souls experience the transcendence of God through prayer, through our participation in the sacraments. And we may find that sometimes our secular work colleagues are kind of puzzled by religious belief, and sometimes our Catholic brothers and sisters are kind of mystified by our, um, by our, our research. And the question is, all is, what's our role as Catholic scientists? What's our special contribution, and what do we bring to the table? We live in a world that seemingly prizes science very, very highly, often to the seeming exclusion of faith. And it can sometimes seem quite challenging to make our, our faith sort of seen or heard or perceived in our very secular scientific workplace. And I know this question is a question of, which is very close to the hearts of many of us, and there are many different kind of angles and ideas and perspectives that we could take. But I'm going to talk about a little bit about my personal experience, first of all, and then I'm going to offer some reflections based on some of the documents from Vatican II and also for some of the writings from John Paul II. And this is not like a super academic intellectual talk. It's more like a kind of personal reflection on my opinion on what it means to be a a Catholic scientist or a scientist who's Catholic, or <laughs> however you like to put it, in this kind of very secular world that we live on. So there's a document, Christy Villalos Leitzi, which warns us against the temptation of legitimizing the unwarranted separation of faith from life. That is, a separation of the gospel's acceptance from the actual living of the gospel in various situations in the world. And this is a temptation which I feel that like I've often fallen into in the past. Like, I've been a Catholic, you know, lived my Catholic faith, and had my very kind of separate, kind of secular world, my world of research and science. And it can seem quite challenging, it's like quite frightening, to talk to our secular colleagues about our faith. And this is a big temptation for me. Now, let's see. So I want to talk, first of all, about some of my experiences, and experiences that happened to me in the kind of past year, that really changed things for me, and really helped me to overcome this kind of fear of talking about faith. Uh. So just to kind of set the scene, my whole life, since I was about five years old, since we visited the Kennedy Space Center and went to NASA when I was in, when we went to Florida, I always wanted to work in space. In fact, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, that got refined over time, and I ended up um, studying to be a cosmologist. I did astrophysics and cosmology. And I was very lucky. I got to, to do my first postdoc, as Steve mentioned, in Sussex. And I started working on a dark energy survey. And this telescope here, the one at the far back, that is the Blanco telescope. It's a fantastic telescope. It's got a big camera on it called the Dark Energy Camera. And I was kind of happily working on this, on this great project, which I really love working on. And I think, you know, I had nice friends and a good social life and all that kind of stuff. But in my life, I was sort of feeling, well, gosh, you know, Lord, is this it? There's something kind of missing in my life. You know, is this kind of it? I'm going to kind of do science my whole life. And what's the purpose? What's the meaning? Where's it going? So I started really kind of thinking and praying about this in a very serious way. And it got so serious that it got to the point where I was really considering very seriously religious life or consecrated life. 
I was like, gosh, Lord, you know, is this, it? Is this where it's going? So um, things kind of progressed, and I got to know a community, and I started formally discerning with this community. I made a promise with them. I was still living my kind of research life, and I, at this point, I'd moved to Philadelphia, and I was working at the University of Pennsylvania on this project. And I remember a couple of years ago, uh, I was at the telescope, and you can see um, the top left picture is a picture of me and a colleague inside the telescope dome, and the bottom left picture is the control room. And I was sitting in the control room, and at this point, um, the, the, the community I was discerning with had invited me to go to Lima to discern with them formally, as in give up my job and move to Lima, and leave career, and leave academia, get rid of all my stuff, and go. Uh, so I was sitting at the telescope in this kind of huge kind of decision about, wow, what do I do? You know, is this real? Is this really from God? And I was kind of like 80% sure. I was like, yeah, I think God is calling me, but this is like crazy. I can't just leave everything and go, you know. I've worked so hard to get my kind of postdoc and all this. And I remember sitting in the control room and the project director was there, a very serious guy from Fermi Lab. I was like, oh, wow, in a big serious conversation. And, you know, and we were talking about careers. And I did not have the courage to say to him, look, I'm thinking about religious life or conscious life. I was like, I can't say that. You think I'm crazy. Um, and actually, I didn't say anything. But then at some point, I had to make a decision. And I decided to leave my postdoc and go into the same with this community. And of course, I had to tell my boss. And I went to see my boss, and I said to him, Gary, um, I'm really sorry, but I've decided not to continue my postdoc next year. I said, oh, OK. Um, well, if you need some advice in like C++ programming and jobs in industry, just ask me. I was like, well, actually, no. It's, um, I'm thinking about contemplated life, and he's like, oh, well, I, I can't help you with that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, he was incredibly supportive, and it was a really, really hard decision for me to make. And a few months later, I went to my, what I thought was going to be my last collaboration meeting, because we've got a big collaboration about 300 scientists, and I probably personally spoke to about 30 or 40 scientists in that collaboration, telling them of my decision. And I have to say, I was overwhelmed by the support, tolerance, goodwill, um, good reception of that kind of statement that I made. I was like, yeah. sometimes I had to tell people twice because they weren't quite sure I was being serious. Like, yeah, no, really. <laughs> and you know, some people thought, oh, this is a terrible idea and you're not gonna, it's not gonna work out and everything else. But by and large, everybody was remarkably, remarkably supportive. And it was a huge revelation to me that my kind of secular colleagues could be so supportive. And they all came out with little stories like, yeah, so my grandma was in a nursing home, it was run by the Nazareth sisters, and they were great, and they looked after her. Even though they didn't personally have a belief or personally support you know, the Catholic Church or anything else, they were actually really supportive and open to the idea that I had faith, and it was OK to talk about it. And this was like a, a huge revelation and a huge blessing in my life. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I went off to Lima, um, having had, by the way, six weeks of Spanish class. Um, so that was quite <laughs> in my whole life. And um, ended up in Lima. Um, Lima, city of contrasts. About 2% of the population are really, really wealthy. Most are sort of living in just above the poverty line, some kind of middle class, a lot in abject poverty. And I went up here, and most of my life here was really learning Spanish, descending with the community, um, getting lost on the buses quite a lot, and trying to make things work out. And most of my work was not really sort of very kind of apostolic, but I did help out in a few projects, and I did get to witness and experience life in the shanty towns and sort of see what was going on there. And I have to say, it's, it really puts your perspective on human life in, you know, in a new perspective. It's like, gosh, you know, what does it mean to be human? What is, what is humanity? To see people suffering in this way, people like you and I, you know, ordinary kind of kids, teenagers, mums and dads that are struggling to have clean water, to have electricity. We helped build a house out here. It cost $2,000 to build a new house, and it transformed the life of that family for such a small, small um, you know, investment. So this is kind of like a kind of side story about what happened in Lima. Um, I ended up, God provided a job for me. I ended up actually teaching physics in a school. Uh, <laughs> I, I was teaching in a British school, physics, but I got the opportunity also to go up to the Highlands, and I taught uh, a few chemistry classes. I'm not a chemist. It's quite, quite interesting. We searched everywhere in Lima to find red cabbages to do this kind of acids and alkalis classic experiment. And I bought a lot of stuff from the kind of pharmacy to do iodine food starch tests. Um, and the point is that I kind of had this really, really nice experience in Lima and a really profound experience of kind of thinking about life with the universe and everything in all kinds of ways. Unfortunately for me, the, I wasn't really very, very good fit for the order. And they kind of told me this, um, <laughs> which was pretty devastating for me. They were very kind to me, very nice to me, and we're good friends, and it's all fine. But at the time, it was a huge kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, what am I going to do? Um, so 
and I probably spent about a year all together, eight months in Lima, and then kind of coming back afterwards. And I have to say, again, my colleagues welcomed me back into physics with open arms. That was a huge revelation to me, because I thought I thrown in my career, I could never get back into science. And it's like, well, I'm here, you know, I'm post at Penn again, I'm doing astrophysics, and it's kind of worked out. So just, you know, it's just, it's just interesting to see that, you know, the Lord provides, and never be afraid to take a risk for God in these things. Um, and this, this whole experience of going away to sit on my vocation and telling people really kind of changed my perspective and my outlook on, on how we talk to our secular colleagues, and even how we kind of perceive our own vocation. And I want to move on now to talk more sort of uh, formally about some of these um, ideas. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I want to talk now about kind of what I think it means. I, I've reflected on this at some length. Um, our vocation and what it means to be a scientist and, you know, as, as Steve says, not to kind of throw everything in the blender and kind of some kind of weird kind of mess of kind of science and theology and kind of quasi-mysticism stuff. But to think about what it really means to us as individuals to be scientists who are Catholic, who do believe in God. And I want to begin by saying that one of the things that sets us apart from the animals is our ability to wonder, to contemplate the natural world and the universe and our place within it. And, you know, when I'm at the telescope, we really kind of have the sense of wonder, like, wow, you know, we can see these kind of galaxies and, wow, that one's like really beautiful and, gosh, there's this kind of funny object here, what is it? And there's a sense of awe that kind of helps us to transcend ourselves and think beyond. And that's, I want to sort of share with you a paragraph which comes from the, the NSS 2010 Decadal Review which is New World's New Horizons, and it reflects some of these ideas about awe and wonder. And it says, the universe has always beckoned us. Over the course of human civilization, the night sky has provided a calendar for the farmer, a guide for the sailor, a home for the gods. Astronomy led the scientific revolution, which continues to this day, and has revealed that the sky, visible to the naked eye, is really just a hint of a vast and complex cosmos, within which our planet is but a pale blue dot. And by the way, this photo, um, this, is Cassini, this is a Cassini photo of Saturn. That kind of star you can see down there with the arrow, that's Earth as seen from Cassini. You can see it's like a small, insignificant dot in the sky. And it goes on to say that astronomers continue to explore the universe, learning its amazing history, discovering the richness of its contents, and understanding the physical processes that take place in its astounding, diverse environments. Today, astronomy expands knowledge and understanding, inspiring new generations to ask, how did the universe form and the stars first come into being? Is there life beyond Earth? What natural forces control our universal destiny? Because of the remarkable scientific progress in recent decades, particularly the explosion in the last decade of interest in an agency to understand several key areas in astronomy and astrophysics, Scientists are now poised to address these and many, equally and many other equally profound questions in substantive ways. The opportunities of the future fill us with awe, enrich our culture, and frame our view of the human condition. It's pretty profound. Like, I love this passage. I think it's great that we can read this kind of writing in what is essentially a funding proposal for a scientific project. <laughs> I don't know, it's great. Uh, and this, this passage illustrates two key points. So first of all, it tells us that we live in an era of exceptionally high scientific knowledge and progress. And secondly, alongside these great scientific discoveries, there are deep and profound, deep and profound questions about our origin and destiny that are beyond the merely physical. The Decadal Review, okay, this document, it goes on to say that recent astrophysical and cosmological discoveries have both scientific and philosophical implications and has spawned a multitude of fascinating questions about our origins that we are racing toward understanding in the 21st century. Now, I've given you an example from astrophysics, but I'm sure that you could choose from your own disciplines other kind of equally evocative text or ideas or motivations. And I especially like the passage that I chose because it echoes some of the opening quotes from Gaudium et Spes. And these perennial questions of meaning and destiny are mentioned in the encyclical like this. And it says this. Yeah, I think I have it on the side as well. Yeah. It says, Though mankind is stricken with wonder at its own discoveries and power, it often raises questions about the current trend of the world, about the place and role of man in the universe, about the meaning of its individual and collective stirrings, and about the ultimate destiny of reality and humanity. 
yeah, pretty profound again. So as we look around the kind of you know, modern world of smartphones and habitable planets and Wi-Fi and space telescopes and genetics, there are different kinds of questions that we ask. And we can make distinctions between the kind of more abstract questions, uh, fundamental physics questions, and questions which are more like applied science and technology. And I'd say that we're really facing four kinds of questions. Okay, so the first kind of question is like these abstract profound questions about origin, meaning, purpose, and destiny. Secondly, there are questions about the place and importance of humanity, especially given our seemingly insignificant geographical location, you know, a pale blue dot in someone else's sky. And especially when it's asked against this backdrop of discoveries about potentially habitable planets. Thirdly, there are questions about how we do science, why we do science, and how it fits in with human society and the rest of our human endeavors. And fourthly, there are questions about technology, how we use it, and what are our individual and collective responsibilities as scientists with regard to this new knowledge and new technology. So ultimately, these questions only make sense when we consider them in the fully human vantage point which considers both the physical and the supernatural aspects of human nature. How we, ask, how we answer these questions, and even the very fact that we think these questions have answers, um, is one of the fundamental things that distinguishes us from our secular colleagues. As Catholic scientists, we know that we live integrated lives in which faith and reason both play a role. Lifting the human spirit, yeah, we all remember that quote, to the contemplation of the truth. And the purely materialistic worldview only sees part of the truth. So Gaudium et Spes is not a letter to scientists, um, but it says some pretty helpful things about the modern world and about our place in it. And it offers, and it says, you know, that Gaudium et Spes specifically says it's a letter explaining, you know, here's, here's our letter to humanity and about what we think are some of the big questions facing the modern world, especially in the kind of areas of science and technology. And it, go, it goes on to say that, um, you know, Gaudium says it boldly asserts that only in Christ, our Lord and Master, can be found the key, the focal point, the goal of man, of all human activity, as well as all human history. So all human activity and endeavor has its end in man, but it's only in the light of Christ that man can be understood. Beneath the ever-changing landscape of scientific progress and change are many realities that do not change and which have their ultimate foundation in Christ, who is the same today, yesterday, and yes, forever. So accepting that we cannot compartmentalize our lives, our scientific work, our research, our faith, and our human relations is central to understanding our vocation as Catholic scientists. See, we've been baptized into the body of Christ, and we participate in the life of the Trinity. We've been given a special identity, uh, a special mission, a special uh, place in life, um, uh, you know, a special identity as sons and daughters of, of God. A special grace has been bestowed upon us, and that changes everything. Nothing is the same because of that. We've been given a particular vocation and mission which affects everything in our lives, from how we conduct our science and our research to how we relate to others and what we prioritize in life. So in speaking of our um, activity in the world, Gaudium et Spes suggests three criteria for judging human life. Oh yeah, that's my previous slide, I missed that one. But it's an important one. So Gaudium et Spes mentions these things. It says, you know, regarding our human activity, and we can think about this in terms of our scientific activity, is it in accord with the divine plan and will? Does it harmonize with the genuine good of the human race? Does it allow men and women as individuals and as members of society to pursue their total vocation and fulfill it? And I think these are excellent questions to ask ourselves about our individual and collective scientific research. Let's consider these things in, in some more detail. So first of all, does it allow men and women you know, to, to fulfill their total vocation? Okay, so that raises the question, what is our total vocation? You know, what is the fundamental kind of reason that we exist on this earth? You know, where are we going in life? And the prime and fundamental vocation of every baptized Christian is the call to holiness. This is a really important point that it's really, really easy to overlook um, and to think about, oh, well, it's kind of one of those things. 
you know, it doesn't just mean like giving money to charity and building houses in Peru and, you know, going to mass on Sundays. It's something much, much, much deeper than that. We've all been um, clothed in Christ and refreshed by the Spirit. And with St. Paul, we can say, you know, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the grace of our baptism. Life according to the Spirit requires us to follow and imitate Jesus. Guidium at Spurs tells us that whoever follows after Christ, the perfect man, becomes himself more of a man or a woman. Um, Jesus Christ is the model and exemplar of what it means to be fully human, to live a fulfilled life of human flourishing. Our whole lives must be conformed to Christ. In following Jesus more closely and becoming more closely united to him, we are indeed becoming more fully human and more fully ourselves. Now, in a society that wants to keep personal faith, you know, kind of separate, a private matter that we kind of relegate to something that happens behind closed doors once a week in between the kids' football practice, you know, in the weekly grocery shop, this can sound really, really radical, okay? The statements that I've made, even in the context of a gathering of Catholic scientists, like, wow, this is kind of radical stuff, you know, our primary vocation is, you know, about holiness and Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, it can sound really radical. I mean, try telling your secular colleagues this. But it's true, it's really, really important. Um, it's at the heart of the message that Jesus gave to us. The Christian life is a radical way of life. And our Christian vocation is central to who we are. And it touches on every aspect and every moment of our lives. Nothing that we do has any meaning unless it's seen in the light of Christ. It doesn't matter how many papers we publish in nature or science, or how many citations we get, or how many grants we get. You know, if our lives and our careers are not oriented around our fundamental vocation to holiness, none of this means anything. Our scientific work, our pursuit of truth, is a noble vocation. It's a gift from God. It truly is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But only if we see it in this broader context of our universal call to holiness. So once we understand this absolute primacy of our universal call to holiness, we Oh, sorry, I'm going to skip it, yeah, because I think we're a short time. Yeah, so, so that's kind of like the kind of, the kind of broader idea of the kind of context of, you know, our vocation where we're going. But to consider some more specifics about this, so first of all, let's think that and remember that God created the world and gave it to us, and we're called to be in the world and to help order worldly affairs in accordance with God's will. And work is something which is inherent to the dignity of man. In his letter, Laborum Exertions, John Paul II explains to us that man is made in the image of God, partly through the mandate received from his creator to subdue, to dominate the earth. In carrying out this mandate, every man, every human being, reflects the very action of the creator of the universe. And I would add that as scientists, many of us have a special intimacy with the sharing of the work of the creator either because we're personally subduing and manipulating nature and the matter of the universe in our laboratories, or because we're studying and probing the universe, the very kind of nature and structure of the creation. And Guidium Espers gives us some guidance on how to carry out our work. It says, for by the very circumstances of their having been created, all things are endowed with their own stability, truth, goodness, proper laws and order. Man must respect as he isolates them. Man must respect these as he isolates them by the appropriate methods in the individual sciences or arts. Therefore, if method methodological investigations within every branch of learning is carried out in a genuinely scientific manner and in accord with the moral norms, it never truly conflicts with faith. For earthly matters and concerns of faith derive from the same God. We know that. Indeed, this is a good bit. Whoever labors to penetrate the secrets of reality with a humble and steady mind, even though he is unaware of the fact, is nevertheless being led by the hand of God who holds all things in existence and gives them their identity. Isn't that incredible? You know, to think that we as scientists in our research are being led by the very hand of God to study and to know more about his own creation. It's a privilege to know that in our scientific research, we are being led by the hand of God. Uncovering the fundamental laws of the universe is a good, beautiful, and noble thing. It gives us an insight into the handiwork of God and the mind of the creator. 
Of course, how we, choose to use, how we choose to use his knowledge is altogether a different question. And as Gaudi Mitzvah tells us, with this great honor also comes great responsibility. Man is becoming aware of his responsibility to guide aright the forces that he has unleashed, which can enslave him or minister to him. Now, I don't know if you're kind of aware of this, but the, the proper order of things is for creation to be subject to man through the process of work. Now, John Paul II explains that. Work is a good thing for man, a good thing for his humanity, because through work, man not only transforms nature, okay, we do that in science, adapting it to his own needs, but he also achieves fulfillment as a human being and, de and indeed, in a sense, becomes more a human being. Now, work of any sort ought to be dignified and a sharing in the creative work of, the crea of God. And it shouldn't become oppressive, dehumanizing, or degrading. And we can think of many, many examples in the realm of science and technology where the proper order has become reversed and man has become subject to creation and has been subdued by work. We can think of many trivial examples, you know, of never being disconnected from our work emails, you know, or unhealthy conditions in factories and industrial plants. And now remembering that we're called to be leaven in society, we can think about what we can do to promote the dignity of work in our scientific area. How do we prevent it from becoming dehumanizing and oppressive? How do we treat our graduate students and postdocs and technicians? I've been extremely fortunate. I've worked with excellent colleagues. I've had no problems. Um, it's been really wonderful, as you've heard previously. But I've certainly got many friends who are grad, stu grad students or postdocs who work long hours, work all the weekends, get paid very little. And I would say they're being exploited. You know, what are, what, are, what are our expectations for tenure, for tenure track professors? You know, do we expect staff and colleagues to work at the weekends and evenings and thereby destroying family life? Has the blessing of work been transformed into the burden of toil? Because toil, says John Paul II, is likewise familiar to those at an intellectual workbench, that's us, to scientists, to those who bear the burden of grave responsibility of decisions that will have a vast impact on society. So the huge blessings that come to uh, society through improvements in, in science and technology have been discussed in the Second Vatican Council. And yet, and then yet Gaudium et Spes, you know, points to um, this tragedy that whilst never has a human race enjoyed such an abundance of wealth, resources, and economic power, and yet such a huge proportion of the world's citizens are still tormented by hunger and poverty. And again, in Laudate Si, almost 50 years later, Pope Francis continued this theme at some length, talking about how the combination of technological advance and economic desires has done little to improve the conditions of the poor. Scientific advances can supply the material for human progress, but of themselves, they can never actually bring it about. And again, Redento Omnius invites us to ask this fundamental question about our scientific work. Does this progress, the work that we're progressing towards, which has man for its author and promoter, make human life on Earth more human in every aspect of that life? Does it make it more worthy of man? There can be no doubt that in various aspects it does. But the question keeps coming back with regard to what is most essential. Whether in the context of this progress, Man, as man, is becoming truly better, that is to say, more mature spiritually, more aware of the dignity of his humanity, more responsible, more open to others, especially the neediest and the weakest, and, ready to give, and readier to give aid to all. How can we as scientists ensure that our work and that our scientific advances are used to alleviate the suffering of the neediest? As Catholic scientists, we have a special responsibility to ensure that science and scientific progress is used to promote human flourishing on all levels of society. Now, I'm aware that we're, we're kind of coming to the end here, and Steve's looking a bit anxious there. So <laughs> I'm going to draw to a close, but um, I just want to, you know, I realize that I've kind of scratched the surface on a few kind of small ideas here. Um, but I just want to summarize the kind of the key points that we've been talking about before, before ending. It's like, a few points, don't worry, it's going to be over. <laughs> okay, so first of all, our fundamental vocation is to holiness. And our scientific research is a wonderful blessing from God, but it only finds its true meaning 
when it's seen in the light of our fundamental vocation to holiness. Secondly, people experience a sense of awe at the universe, which inspires us and them to look beyond themselves, to question the meaning of life. Now, we as Catholics know that true meaning of life, and we know it can only be understood in the light of Christ. And part of our job is to help people to see that and to understand that. Thirdly, the search for truth is a noble pursuit. As Catholics, we understand that there is absolute truth. And in the pursuit of that truth, we give glory to the author of all truth. Fourthly, we're made in the image and likeness of God. And we share in the creative work of God, transforming nature. As scientists, we have a special share in this work since we work so closely with nature. Fifthly, we have a duty of stewardship towards science and technology to direct this knowledge to wherever it is most needed, to improve the lives of others in every sense, materially, intellectually, and spiritually. And sixthly, and most difficultly, we have a duty of evangelization. Today's mission territory is not some faraway land. Today's mission territory is our university. It's our research institute, it's our lab, it's our secular colleagues. And I'm just gonna finish there and remind you that, you know, I was terrified about speaking about the faith, but do not be afraid. You know, as our Lord so often said to us, do not be afraid. And please be prepared to risk everything for the Lord, who will reward you abundantly. Thank you.